But in winter of 2020, when Lisbon was in lockdown, um, I decided to take a short break to Madeira just to see what it was like. And it was meant to be a three week trip, but I ended up staying until now, almost two years later. Um, and why was that? Well, Madeira was captivating in so many ways, and particularly for me as someone who's involved a lot in online work and also finishing a PhD remotely, um, I found it the perfect environment for networking, for productivity, and with this very strong entrepreneurial vibe. And especially at the time I came here when the Digital Nomad Village project was just about to emerge onto the scene, um, the, the vibe here was very motivating. And I'm gonna go into uh, six benefits of Madeira, what I think are the biggest ones for expats and remote workers. So first we'll start with the most obvious one, I think, which is the lifestyle in Madeira. Anyone who's ever been here on holiday will know that it's usually summer all the year round. And it's a fantastic place for people who enjoy the outdoorsy lifestyle because you've got the hiking and the lavadas. You've got tons of water sports and natural beauty all around you. So I think for somebody who, speaking for myself, someone who spends the majority of their time in front of a computer screen, it's really nice to have that nature so close by because it's very soothing and it's, it's really good to have an antidote to all that screen time. So I think in that sense, um, it's a paradise for remote workers. And that's just the first benefit. The second one I would say, although this is perhaps changing a little now, but it's still relatively affordable to, to live in Madeira when compared to somewhere like London or Paris. Um, although I would say the real estate and the rent prices are going up now on the island, especially in places like central Funchal and perhaps Ponte de Sol and other um, foreigner hotspots. You can still find a lot of bargains if you're willing to live a bit outside of those areas. Um, and it is possible to live a simple lifestyle here. So, you know, um, if you live in central Funchal, you can get by without having a car. I did that for about the first year and a half, and I only got one earlier this year when I moved to Praia Formosa. So um, I think another benefit maybe a disadvantage too, but, but the language here, you know, like you don't have to feel nervous about not being able to communicate with people if you don't speak Portuguese yet. Um, for English speakers, it's very easy to live and, and manage your daily life here in English because almost everyone I've ever met here speaks excellent English. So you shouldn't have any issues. The slight disadvantage with that is that I struggle to get better at Portuguese. So if you really want to learn Portuguese, as, as I do eventually, you will have to make that extra push to, to keep practicing. As well as that, um, Madeira is surprisingly well connected for an island. So a lot of people ask me, don't you get island fever living so far away in, in the middle of the Atlantic almost? <clears throat> and I tell them, no, not really, because there are so many direct flights from here, not only to mainland Portugal, um, I think Lisbon, Porto, and, and perhaps Faro as well, but so many European capitals you, you, can, you can access directly from Funchal. And I think now there's even a flight to New York directly from Funchal. So that's fantastic. And if you're a resident here, you also get uh, big flight discounts on return flights from, from Madeira to the mainland. So really there's, there's no way you're gonna get island fever living in Madeira. Um, the next thing, and this is a point Claudia is gonna expand upon more and Nunu, but it's um, the tax benefits of Madeira. So you've probably heard of the, the NHR, Special Tax Programme for all of Portugal, which can, can at times be a good fit potentially for remote workers and pensioners. But Madeira also offers particular tax benefits for new businesses because it's a special economic zone. And I know Nuno will go more into that in his talk. The final benefit, but I think a really important one as well, is that the community in, in Madeira is very uh, supportive, I think. And people typically associate Madeira with, with the older generation, with, with foreign pensioners, perhaps British and German communities in particular, right? And that community is well represented here, but there's more and more younger people coming here now. So, you know, the remote workers from around the world and, and young families as well with kids more and more. So it's very easy to find your, your niche and find your people and fit in. And there's lots of activities now and resources for remote workers and digital nomads, including the Digital 
traditional nomad village in Ponte de Sol, but also um, co-working spaces. I think there's two now in Funchal, um, and maybe Machico even has, has one now. And there's lots of events organized and cafes where you can take your laptop and work remotely. So I think <clears throat> in light of all that, it's a very conducive environment to, to have a, a successful life working remotely and, and not feel lonely or, or isolated. You feel stimulated and, and excited. And that's fantastic, in my opinion, and in my experience. So that's a wrap for, from me. I'm just going to answer one of the questions that came in, which I think um, I'm well placed to deal with. Um, we were asked, what's the potential of a remote mental health professional in the island of Madeira if they plan to practice there? I think that there's a very good potential for this, um, especially if you work remotely with, on Zoom with overseas clients. So I know several therapists here who, who are working remotely. In particular, I've got some friends who run a hypnotherapy practice fully remote from Madeira, uh, working with US and Canadian clients and, and doing everything over Zoom. And I think there could potentially be, um, you know, the chance to find clients in person uh, among the local expat community as well. So um, good potential overall for, for therapists. I hope that answered your question. I'm going to segue over to Michaela now from Startup Madeira, and she's going to tell us more about the remote work and, and startup scene on the island. So Michaela, over to you. Thank you so much, Samantha. Indeed, this is uh, a very good introduction to what I'm going now to explain. So that's that's fantastic. I think that you already seen my presentation. Um, so uh, as you as as Samantha was saying very well, uh, we are we are a startup Madeira. We are an incubation center here in the island. So we always have been working with entrepreneurs, with ideas, with projects, with startups. And for many of them, we even knew that it was definitely possible to be working in Madeira remotely from the island to the world because of all of the advantages um, that Dave and Samantha already explained. But there was lacking something official in this case for digital nomads and remote workers. So that's exactly what we did um, in back in 2020. We knew that uh, there were still digital nomads that were coming to the island in 2020 to the few hotels that were still open to use the working spaces here in Punchal, but they were kind of spread out. So besides that, we also knew that um, we, we even welcomed here in Nadare in September 2020, a digital nomad and remote work consultant called uh, Gonzalo Hall. And while he was here in Nadare doing this conference, online one, of course, uh, he was blown away by all the conditions that the digital nomads were looking for when choosing a remote destination. So uh, definitely he found that Madeira gathered all of those conditions, but why wasn't still uh, on the official map for the digital nomads? Uh, because we do have indeed the breathtaking landscapes, you know, we are close to the mountain, we're close to the sea. Uh, we gather all the great conditions for the good infrastructure, we have good internet, we have good weather all year round. Uh, so why wasn't still on the official um, map for that? So something needed to be done for this niche of market. And that's exactly what we did with Gonzalo and with us as well with the regional government of Mandara. Uh, and the idea was to create this concept of a nomad village. And the nomad village was a place that put in just one spot all of the things that the digital nomads remote workers were looking for. So in this case, a place where it has a working space, cafes, restaurants nearby, accommodation, and with the plus bonus of having the sea and the mountain just right next to it. So all of these conditions were the perfect ch the chance to choose Punta do Sol at this nomad village. And that's exactly what they did. And this started to be created so you can have an idea back in November. We launched at least the, the project officially in November of 2020. And uh, after choosing the, the, the Nomad Village to be taking place in Ponto do Sol, we created the website uh, as Digital Nomads Madeira Island. And it was supposed to have, and it still does, all of the, the information that they are looking for and all the benefits that they have as long as they are doing the registration on our website, which is completely for free. So what we want to do is that we have created indeed this community 
And we started by creating it online, of course, and just have we have a channel and it's on our Slack channel. Uh, we present them a free working space that they can use in this working in Ponte do Sol, the Nomad Village. And they have a list of accommodation places they can stay monthly. And of course, the working spaces, events, and even access more closely to the community. So after we identified the working space, which is in Ponte do Sol, uh, it is in the cultural John um, Passos. And it, it can be done and be used by over 50 people at the same time. And since February 1st, I guess over 1,000, almost 2,000 people were already there since the beginning of the project. And they have access to a desk with share to the free internet. And most importantly, it's a great opportunity to be working side by side with like-minded people. So that indeed facilitates all the process of, the, of being sharing knowledge, information, even networking, and even creating synergies and partnerships. As as Startup Nadara, we are very fond of creating partnerships and you know growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem. For us, this is a big bonus and that's very interesting. So when we opened the doors on, on February of 21, this was during um, one of the, the worst times because of the pandemic, most of the hotels were still closed and the restaurants still. So this was indeed a very good impact in the economy, in the local economy, because most of the local accommodations were being used, the restaurants were being adapted, some of them in, even created menus for digital nomads with vegetarian dishes. Uh, so it was indeed and has been a very interesting and sustainable growth with the community. And uh, it has been also very interesting to see that not only did the hotels adapt to it, because they even they started creating these monthly rates for digital nomads, but to see as well more and more accommodation houses being open to do these monthly rates, and even seeing the growth and the creation of co-living Syrian modality for this niche of market. So as for us, this is very important because what we wanted with the project since the beginning is to help with the local economy impact here in the island, but more than that is the sustainable growth of it and the social and the cultural aspect of it. Um, so seeing that in the 100% to the local private entities, if that's exactly what we want and it has been indeed achieved. So it's all about the community indeed, and Samantha mentioned very well, it's all about the people here in the, in the island. And so seeing that we started by having 300 people in January and February, but that number grew a lot since then. And to see that people were enjoying the time together to be partaking in workshops, to be partaking in networking moments, or even just going in the end of the day for a swim or for a dive or for a hiking during the weekends. Uh, our time zone allows, who knows, maybe to do a hike in the morning to go for a swim in the afternoon having a Zoom call to the United States or the other way around in the morning. So that definitely brings this wellness to the way that you may be working. So this is our, some of the images of the working space that we have there in front of the soul. Um, and um, it's now it's different and it's been interesting because of all the partners that have been created for the project, it definitely was a big advantage to make it easier to get the information you know, out everywhere. <laughs> so we started by having Punta do Sol, but the idea is definitely to grow. So having partners like Foteu and other local accommodation partners definitely allow us to do that. So, so now that you can have an idea of how, what kind of profile of people are coming to Madeira, besides Samantha, we do have indeed a lot of people that as long as they can be working remotely, um, they definitely come and choose Madeira as a place to do that. So we have from 18 to 80 years old now reg registrations. Usually they stay from one to three months. Some of them decide to stay longer up to one year. And there is a visa, the D7 visa that is usually most used or other programs as the NHR. And I think it will be discussed here as well. Um, but, and then as for professions, it can be like entrepreneurs, developers, graphic designers, lawyers, well, any kind of job type of, as long as they can be doing from a data, I'm sure that they will. Talking about numbers, so far we have received over 13,400 registrations, representing a total of 128 countries. The top of the list is United States and UK. 
it's very interesting for us to see that growth happening. And for the most of these people, digital nomads, remote workers, even some students, is the first time that they ever heard about the data. And they not only are hearing about it, but they are coming here to the island and staying as much as they can here. Um, and seeing this growth about the island as a destination definitely was achieved because we wanted, remember, to put us on the official map for digital nomads. We are definitely there. And there is a list, there's a website called the Nomad List. And when we started with the project, as when I say we, is the, the, the organization, everyone, uh, we knew that we were like in the eighth, uh, 80, um, the rank 80, I guess. But now we are always in the top 15. Uh, in a very sustainable way. And for us, it's a very interesting because this is a very organic ranking. Now it's all about drawing the future and um, we started in Punta del Sol, but other locations are being created by the local entrepreneurs, by the local private entities, and it is being adapted to it. Uh, we have locations like Mexico that remote discourses by Dinet Fratas, that she has like, helping with accommodation there, she has a, a working space there, so that can be used. We have someone that has a co-living in Santa Seca, the home office, and that's very interesting as well. We have one hotel in Keniso that has been adapting their place, not only for accommodation, but also for the working space as well that it can be used. Here in Funchal, we do have co-work Funchal that have been done an amazing job so for many years now, and they have been very used to digital nomads as well. But now, of course, with the booming, it has changed a lot. <laughs> so that's fantastic. We have a place called Design Center in Indrat Silva, which is a coffee shop, and they have adapted to it as well for the digital nomads. And we do have indeed a community management team that is uh, Madera Fitness Friends. And they have also been doing an amazing job by creating this networking moments with a lot of uh, events and sport related to, and even just events where people just can join. Um, other, as other locations, definitely Porto Santo is another island that we have here in Madara. Uh, and uh, it's definitely one location that is going to be great for the autumn and fall, for the low season, which was something that we believe during the project. And uh, from this October on, there will be plenty of events. So I'm now coming to the end of it. I guess that the, the, the secret here, there is no secret at all, because in the end, it's all about the community and the authenticity of Madara. We cannot pretend that Nadara is, it is as it is because it truly, really, it is um, the essential way of presenting themselves as a location where it's possible to live and to work from. So it definitely gathers all the condition of hospitality here in Nadara. And this is only possible because of the many people that is doing the project by itself in a very organic way and by the local and private entities. And this is only being possible because of them, including you, Cole, that is here, that was with us since the very beginning. And I think that um, they can definitely prove what I say. And uh, in the beginning, we're having two to 300 emails a day, not joking about the Madeira, about so many questions. They were very keen to it. So I, I now officially uh, say thank you to Claudia. They're doing an amazing job. So if everyone wants to know more about the project, making a registration, learn more about what is happening, you can make the registration uh, using the website. And this are, these are my, my contacts if you want to use it somehow. So thank you. Great stuff, Michaela. Thank you. Um, I remember that time in Madeira during the pandemic. It was a, it was a very interesting time to be on the island. And I can see that, you know, your, this, this initiative has really put Madeira on the map and it, it got so much press coverage. So it was really, really great work. And it always amazes me, you know, um, that such a wide range of online work is possible now. You know, like I know lawyers here who are working 100% remotely. So, you know, it's um, much broader than it, than it used to be in the past. Um, so thanks. Um, there's a question here um, that came in that I think would be a good one for you. Um, it's from a digital marketing professional who's looking to start their own venture and they want to know if it's possible to get market research related data about, about Madeira. Is there, are there any sources for that that you know of? Um, there is a lot of information and data about the island, about the project that could be interesting to make a denunciation of the file. Uh, there are some that are public, uh, so it's easy to find, but then if we have the context, maybe I can share with them. 
Okay, so hopefully they can drop you an email and take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks so much. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Madeira also has some some interesting and very specific benefits for new companies that want to incorporate here in the in the special economic zone. We've got Nuno here from the Madeira International Business Center, and he's going to take a deeper dive into that now. So, Nuno, over to you. Thank you, Samantha. Well, we do in fact have a special tax regime here in Madeira, which has been approved in the late 80s. Uh, and, and it's been going on ever since. Uh, this tax regime was approved when Portugal joined the European Union. And the idea behind it was to develop the local economy and to diversify uh, the, the economic activities in Madeira and also to be a source of additional tax revenue for Madeira. Um, this is a tax regime which has a pre-approval by the European Commission. So we go through a process of agreement between the Portuguese government and the EU in order to uh, implement the tax regime. This happens uh, normally every five years. Uh, this should have taken place in 2020, but due to, to COVID, uh, all the negotiations were delayed and they're about to happen later this year or early next year. So at the moment, we have a tax regime which accepts new companies um, until the end of 2023, uh, and which will be in place or will apply a special set of tax incentives until the end of 2027. Uh, the tax regime itself is based on the Portuguese uh, tax regime. So everything is the same in terms of uh, the ways that the companies uh, calculate their own profits and what kind of deductions they may or may not do. The only difference is that the, the rate of tax will be much lower here in the International Business Center of, of Madeira. It's currently 5%, which applies to all profits uh, deriving from operations carried out outside of Portuguese uh, territory. Um, and the uh, other aspect of the tax regime is that there is no withholding tax on any payments made by the IBC company. Uh, that includes dividends, capital gains, interest, royalties and services. So basically the only taxation that takes place is at the company level, which is the 5% on only, on only <clears throat> any uh, income deriving from non-domestic uh, uh, operations. Um, as I said, the tax regime is approved until the end of 2027. Later this year, the Portuguese government will initiate conversations with the EU, with the EC, in order to uh, postpone or to extend the tax regime until the end of 2034. Now, <clears throat> this tax regime has certain conditions in order for the companies to benefit from the reduction of tax. The first condition is that there is in fact a certain level of substance in Madeira. So companies are in fact um, required to have local substance. That substance uh, translates into job creation. So companies will have to at least create one local job. Uh, they have six months after they start their activity in Madeira to create that job. Um, and they also may have to make uh, a minimum investment of 75,000 euros in fixed assets, tangible or intangible, depending on the number of jobs they create in those first six months. Uh, that investment normally is uh, fulfilled by our clients through uh, office acquisition in Madeira. They normally buy an office or if they have any intellectual property in their balance sheet that will also fulfill uh, the substance requirement. And by intellectual property, I mean some software licenses, uh, some image rights or some brand that they can explore uh, and to fulfill that uh, minimum requirement of the 75,000 euros of investment. Once the companies fulfill these requirements of the job creation and the minimum investment, they are in, uh, ready to start their activity and to benefit from uh, the, the special tax incentives. Um, the companies have two years to make the, the minimum investment and six months in order to create the, the minimum job requirements. In terms of activities, the most common activities in Madeira are by far the trading activity in which companies import from uh, Asia, from South, South America or South Africa, and they use Madeira as a platform 
to uh, export those products uh, into the EU. Um, in fact, <clears throat> the IBC of Madeira should be seen as a platform uh, for international transactions rather than uh, a, a way to invest into Portugal, into, into Madeira, because as I explained earlier, um, there is no tax benefits in investing in, in, Madeira, in Portugal or in Madeira through an IBC company. So Madeira is in fact a platform, the IBC of Madeira is in fact a platform for international transactions. So again, trading being one of the most common activities, but also shareholding, uh, the management of intellectual property, uh, professional services, uh, such as digital marketing, uh, or marketing, normal, traditional marketing, or uh, other professional services, such as legal services. Uh, we have been successful in recent years in attracting companies in the ICT sector, which includes telecommunications, e-business, e-commerce. We are uh, having quite a few companies developing software in, in, in Madeira, and they are recruiting locally, which is also a very interesting impact that these companies have in the local economy, is that we have a local university, which has a very good uh, uh, computer engineering uh, course in, uh, going on. And many of our clients uh, do recruit locally, not just because they are very competitive, in fact, but uh, also because in terms of wages, Madrid is very competitive as well. So this allows the companies not only to just benefit from a reduced taxation, but they can also enjoy uh, lower uh, <coughs> running costs in, in Madeira. Um, we also have a very strong uh, shipping register in Madeira uh, for the registration of commercial vessels and yachts. Uh, but other than that, provided that these activities are of a non-financial uh, nature, they can set up in Madeira and benefit from the, the, the reduction of tax to 5%. Um, the IBC of Madeira has been very important in terms of diversifying the local economy. We've been attracting companies which by their nature uh, would not normally come to Madeira. Uh, telecommunications, software development, uh, uh, energy production, uh, renewable energy production, uh, shipping activities, uh, all of these activities have been presenting uh, an opportunity for local people, not just to stay in Madeira, but also to uh, work in, in an international environment and to work in uh, activities which normally would not be present in Madeira if it wasn't for the ABC of Madeira. One of the other benefits of the ABC is the fact that we do provide uh, an additional tax re revenue for, for, for Madeira. Uh, we uh, represent two thirds of the corporate income tax revenues of Madeira presently. Um, and there's, there is also a spillover effect uh, of the other uh, sectors of activity in Madeira. Uh, these companies interact with the local economy. Uh, they also uh, provide indirect job creation in transportations and business tourism and real estate and so on. So there is a major impact, not just directly, but also indirectly to other sectors of activity in, in Madeira. Um, and this is why the ABC was created. The, the, it provides with Madeira with an additional uh, tool for our development and also to uh, bring additional revenue for Madeira and to present local people with the opportunity to stay and live in Madeira with their families, uh, doing something which is very interesting uh, in professional terms. Uh, there were some questions asked um, beforehand. Uh, one of them was if there is any uh, specific incentive for uh, cannabis uh, production. Um, there is not. Uh, what these companies may benefit, in fact, is from the tax regime of the ABC of Madeira. Uh, in fact, uh, cannabis production is allowed within the ABC of Madeira, uh, and they can also uh, uh, trade uh, cannab cannabis for medicinal uh, purposes um, through a trading company in the ABC of Madeira. So there is this incentive uh, of the 5% and the withholding tax exemption on this type of activities. Other questions were about royalties. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, companies which are engaged in the managing of the intellectual property and other type of uh, 
uh, royalties associated activities. The 5% will be applicable to this type of activities. Um, other countries have implemented patent boxes, for example, in order to apply a more reduced rate of tax. Here in the ABC of Madeira, the 5% will be applicable to these activities, though, so there is no need to apply any patent box. The companies which manage IP will receive royalties, and these royalties will be taxed at the 5%. Um, there's an additional interesting aspect is that Portugal applies a unilateral tax credit, which means that if these royalties have suffered any withholding tax at the origin, we can deduct those uh, that withholding tax in Madeira up to the 5%. So in some in certain cases, uh, companies engaged in intellectual property uh, management will uh, be subject to close to 0% taxation in Madeira which is also very uh, interesting, obviously. Um, there were also an additional question about the sale of a Madeira company. We have a participation exception regime in Portugal, which is also applicable to Madeira companies. That participation exception applies both at the corporate level, but also the shareholders level, which means that if you have a company in Madeira, um, which has some qualified shareholdings. And by qualified, I mean that these companies have at least 10% of the shareholding of the subsidiary uh, held for at least one year. In that case, both dividends and capital gains will be exempt in Madeira uh, or in Portugal, but also to Madeira companies. Uh, but the same thing also happens on the way out. If you have a Madeira company, if this company is sold, then the participation exemption also applies, which means that the capital gains resulting from that sale will not be taxed in Portugal. Uh, so again, not only do companies have a, a very interesting taxation uh, while in Madeira, but if they do in fact leave or, or, or if the shareholders sell the, 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 the company, there will be no further taxation, so, which means there, there are no exit taxes. Just to uh, summarize, then we also have these negotiations which will take place later this year. This tax regime will very likely be uh, very similar to the present one. Uh, the, uh, the tax regime will be extended until the end of 2034. And, and I see two advantages in that. One is that once the tax regime has been approved by the European Commission, it means that we are fully compliant with the EU guidelines and the EU principles on taxation. Um, it also um, sets a deadline for the application of the, the reduced taxation to the companies. And that is a un unique situation in Europe. Uh, there are not many situations in which a jurisdiction can guarantee a special uh, set of tax incentives for a, a predetermined period uh, in which case it will be 2034, which will grant companies with 11 years of a very stable, transparent, regulated uh, environment in which to do uh, business and also with the uh, very interesting uh, set of tax incentives. Um, my uh, colleague will speak this, uh, about this uh, in a little more detail, but I would also like to say that in terms of complying with the job creation requirement in Madeira, there is the non official tax regime, which is very interesting, to attract non-Portuguese or non-resident, uh, non-Portuguese resident uh, workers into Madeira to work for these companies. So the advantages also apply uh, in terms of uh, attracting people into Madeira to, to work in these companies. So that's basically, in a nutshell, uh, the ABC of Madeira. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nuno. Indeed, I think the IBC is a really exciting opportunity for, you know, for online business owners as well, and especially those who work with foreigners and for those who live outside Portugal but want to hire Madeiran employees. So um, thank you very much for that. Now we're going to take a look at individual and more personal relocation because so many people are now moving to Madeira. And fortunately, Portugal has a lot of different immigration options. So there's usually something for everyone. And there are also some tax benefits for, for new arrivals in Portugal. Um, but it's not always as simple as that. And there's several important nuances to be aware of. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Claudia now, who's going to talk us through all of that.
Yes, thank you, Samantha. In fact, uh, it can be a very interesting regime, but uh, it doesn't apply to everyone, or it may not be uh, as advantageous as we might think at first to everyone. One important clarification that I'd like to leave very clear is that the NHR status can be granted to those who become tax residents in Portugal, not having been considered a resident in the prior, in the past five years. And according to Portuguese law, you are considered a tax resident in Portugal if you stay in Portugal for more than 183 days, consecutive or non-consecutive in any 12 month period starting or ending in a specific year, in a year in question. Or if having stayed for less time, so less than the six months, you have on any day of that 12 month period, a housing or accommodation that show in a, such a condition that shows your intention to use it as your habitual residence. This is very important because we are often asked about the 183 days, and we got some questions about it today. Will I only be considered a tax resident if I spend more than those days in Madeira? No, actually, you can be considered from a Portuguese perspective a tax resident in Portugal and be subject to the, the personal income tax regime if you stay less than those, that period and um, meet and uh, have, for instance, uh, the, an accommodation that is used as your habitual or main residence. Another important aspect, very important actually, is that once you become a tax resident in Portugal, you can apply for the special NHR regime status at any moment, but no later than the 31st of March of the year following the one you became a tax resident. And this can be quite tricky because imagine if you become a resident in Portugal on the 1st of January 2022, the deadline for the NHR registration is March 2023. But if you register two days before, like the 30th of December 2021, then the deadline is March 2022. And if you didn't pay attention to that, you may miss it. If you don't register within the, de the deadline, the tax authorities will in principle deny the status uh, and you'll be subject to the standard personal income tax regime. So this question of the deadline is quite important. Now, once granted, the special NHR status is, uh, guaranteed for, is granted for 10 years and it provides certain advantages, mostly depending on the source and the type of income. For income obtained in Portugal, namely salaries and self-employment freelance income in, uh, that is undertaken or derived from an activity included in the list of high value added activities, that's a specific list describing which cat professional categories are included and considered high value added activities, uh, that income is taxed at a flat rate of 20% instead of the progressive tax rates that apply under the general personal income tax regime. For example, as Nuno mentioned, we have many clients who have created it and uh, set up an international uh, company, an IBC company, and manage their international activities through an IBC company, taking advantage of the special corporate income tax regime that Nuno has described, but also benefiting as directors uh, of the Madeira company from the, the flat tax rate of 20% applied to their salaries. Income obtained abroad. In this case, in the case of salaries, uh, they can be they are exempt in Portugal, provided that they are taxed at source. According to a double tax treaty signed by Portugal, we have about 80 uh, double tax treaties, or in case there is no treaty, if they are not considered to have been obtained in Portugal. But one important question here is that it must really the, sal the salaries must have been taxed at source self-employment issue derived from high value added activities can be also exempt in Portugal, but only if it may be taxed at source according to a double treaty signed by Portugal or according to the rules when there is no treaty, according to the rules defined in the OECD model convention. 
Please note, however, that most conventions only grant the source state the right to tax if the work is undertaken in that country through a permanent establishment. From our experience, this is seldom the case. So in practice, most freelance work uh, income obtained abroad will be taxed in Portugal. If the freelancer is working uh, remotely in Portugal, that is usually the case, it will be taxed at the flat rate of 20%. Dividends, real estate income and capital gains can also be exempt in Portugal, again, if they may be subject to tax according to a double tax treaty signed by Portugal. Now, in practice, dividends are usually exempt in Portugal, provided that the company paying those dividends has adequate substance and effective management in the source country. But capital gains, for instance, are usually more complex and have to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis. If they don't benefit from the exemption, they can be in generally taxed at 28%. So, if you are an EU citizen, you have the right to live and work in Portugal, and it is pretty easy to get the tax residence and access the NHR status. We've just had the case of a client whom we've helped incorporate an IBC company, rent an apartment in Madeira, change her residency and get the NHR status all in about a month. But if you are from non -EU, non, a non-EU country and you want to spend more than the 90 days in Madeira, then a residence permit is required. Portugal issues very temporary residence permits. Michaela mentioned, for instance, the D7, which is a self um, passive income, self-sufficiency, passive income and pension uh, visa. But there are others for investment, entrepreneurship, work, uh, for startups, uh, also highly qual qualified workers. These usually, these types of visas, with the exception of the investment, uh, require that you stay in Portugal for six consecutive months or eight non-consecutive months in a 12-month period. So here we come back to the tax resident issue and the subject to tax in Portugal, to personal income tax. Now, if living or working in Madeira is not your primary goal, uh, in, at least in the short run, or if you are not eligible for one of the other types of, for the other types of residence permits, there is the golden visa, which is um, a residence permit for investment purposes. Uh, and it has many advantages because it grants you and your immediate family access to Portugal and all the Schengen countries with a minimum stay in Portugal of seven days a year, plus the possibility to get a, re a permanent residence permit after five years and even apply for citizen citizenship after six years. Now, there are different ways to get a golden visa in Portugal, but since Madeira is one of the regions um, that way that allows the uh, application for a golden visa through an investment in a property for residential purposes. This has been one of the preferred choices of most of our clients. As we've, well, has been mentioned, Samantha, Michaela, Madeira is a very well-known tourist destination with uh, a high occupancy, occupancy rates throughout the whole year. Uh, a good offer of quality properties at different prices, locations, and architectural styles. So this enables very good returns on investment for those who want to lease or invest in short-term rentals during those periods when they are not living on the island. So in practice, you can get a residence permit without the obligation to stay in Portugal for the one, six months or eight months, without the obligation to become a tax resident um, in Madeira and still uh, getting a great, a very good return on the investment. The minimum investment in Madeira starts at 350,000 euros for a 30 year old uh, rehabilitated property or one located in a, an, a rehabilitation area or 5,000 euros for a brand new uh, property. Now, I won't go into much more details because we have time constraints, but we are uh, available and Elena uh, will um, give you our emails and contact details. So both me and our real estate and relocation team will be happy to provide uh, any additional information that you require. Thanks, Claudia. 
Um, as you can see, there's a lot of detail involved in, in moving here, and sometimes it's not always as straightforward as people think. And there's also quite a lot of confusing information in forums and Facebook groups and so on. So it definitely helps to have a professional guiding you. Um, I think there's just two questions here that I'm going to ask you because the others were covered in your talk. Um, the first is, um, will Ukrainians, refugees with Portuguese protections, automatically become liable for Portuguese tax after 183 days? Something unique well, about this, right? Yes, as I've uh, mentioned, uh, you don't become a tax resident only after 183 days. And actually, my experience with uh, Ukrainian um, uh, refugees that obtain Portuguese protection under the special protection uh, rules, they are automatically assigned a Portuguese tax number with an address in Portugal and a social security number and the number of utents. So this this means that they become automatically residents, uh, tax resident in Portugal, and uh, it is in this case advisable to uh, seek to register for the NHR status as soon as possible to take advantage of that uh, special tax regime. And the last one, um, I don't know if you can answer this in, in brief, but. Um, if a person is moving with pets from somewhere else in the EU, uh, are there specific documents that they need to prepare? Well, I don't know that uh, information in particular, it's not my area, but we have a relocation department uh, and they will be happy to, um, to help. Uh, we have also some information on our website, so we'll be sharing in the chat the link uh, there, where there is de more detailed information on the list of documents uh, required in that case. Perfect. Okay, Claudia, thanks so much. Um, yeah, we don't have that much time left. So I'm going to hand this back to Elena just to wrap up and, and deal with any new questions that have come in meanwhile. So thank you very much. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you to all the speakers. We have a few questions that came in through the chat. I know that some of them were eventually answered, especially the tax one by Nun Teixeira. But Samantha, th there's a quick question from Chai Desai. Is English widely accepted to, uh, even in non-tourist hotspots? that except Funchal and Ponta do Sol? I believe so, but just a confirmation from you on this? In my experience, yes. Um, I went recently on, on a hike in the, the central mountainous part of Madeira, <clears throat> thinking that the people in the supermarket would not speak English, and they did very well. So <laughs> I actually wanted to practice Portuguese, but um, yeah, generally speaking, it, it's pretty easy. I, I've, I think I've never had a problem anywhere on the island. So there okay. you go. Um, Claudia, there's a question here from John Cleveland about how easy it is to enroll in local schools for non-Portuguese speakers. He's talking, uh, referring to a 12-year-old. Well, there are local schools, Portuguese speaking, and there are international schools as well. It's important to enroll by a specific deadline. There are many applications, but again, this is something that we can assist through our relocation departments. So please contact me. <laughs> Okay, so um, I think this one is for um, from Marcel to Nuno Teixeira. It was uh, following Nuno's presentation. How can I or do I need to invest the 75,000 euros? Am I free to invest this amount anywhere? I know that investing this budget in local real estate, that is an office, is an option, but I don't find this attractive at all. What if I just leave this within the company to pay my local managing director? Is this full f f uh, filling the criteria? No, no. Is the would well, this work? The investment has to be in fixed assets, uh, tangible or intangible. Okay. It can either be an office or it can be uh, intellectual property. Uh, it could be uh, office equipment. It could be a car. Um, so there are a, a few alternatives. However, if the company does create six or more jobs, then it will be dispensed from having to make the investment. So there's an alternative there. Uh, what, I, what I find is that many people who are also moving to Madeira, they will buy a property which will work both as their uh, residential property and their office, and they fulfill the requirement that way. The, 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 the question here is that the investment has to be in the balance sheet as an... an um, fixed assets, whether tangible or intangible. So it's an 
an accounting uh, question. It has to be confirmed that, in fact, in the balance sheet, it will be a, a fixed asset. Okay. And uh, Chai is asking, no, no, how much percentage of corporate tax is applicable if we do not invest the 75,000? If the company does not create jobs or uh, fulfill the, the substance requirement of the investment, then it will fall under the general regime in Madeira, which is um, also interesting in the sense that it's lower than the general regime in mainland Portugal. So the general rate of tax in Madeira general regime is 14.7, 14.7%. So that will be the applicable tax. Okay. There's a question that just popped up from Danny. How has the new court ruling affected property bought for alojamento local in condominiums? Does anyone wish to take this? I can, this? yes, I Claudia? can take this. Yes, I can take this because it's one of the questions that our uh, clients have posed and have been a little bit concerned. Well, it depends from condominium to condominium. Uh, we have received, we have clients who have been approved for the AL after the, this uh, legislation was issued. What we do is when our real estate department when they are assisting clients to find uh, the, or make their investment, we will see what type of condominiums uh, is more likely to uh, allow that. Considering that AL is uh, quite a big uh, relevant activity nowadays, there are many um, condominiums that have different apartments in AL um, situations. So in those cases, it's most likely to that they will approve and that has been the case. Also, there are clients that are investing in uh, individual properties, not within condominiums. But again, it has to be seen on a case by case pa cases basis because now uh, it's more arbitrary on, and it's more on the condominiums hand to decide. Okay, thanks Claudia. I think uh, there's a question here about Ukrainian refugee, refugees. Um, yes. If you have any contact. I think I maybe can, you can send I that can, uh, email or yes. you can answer now. I can answer very quickly one question, but that because this relates to other uh, questions that many people pose. Can I be a tax resident in another country and uh, take advantage of the NHR status? Well, from a Portuguese perspective, as I've mentioned, you can declare that you are a resident in Portugal uh, and apply for the NHR and not spend even the six or more months in Portugal from a Portuguese perspective, but when we have two jurisdictions involved, in this case, imagine Ukraine, um, we have to apply and both challenge the resident status of that person, we have to apply the double tax treaty. Well, the double tax treaty with Ukraine in particular uh, states that the first tiebreaker rule is not uh, usually it's the 183 days, but the, in the case of the double tax treaty with Ukraine, it's not. They actually say that the, the, pers the person is considered a resident of the country where it has its a main residence. So imagine you have a residence in both countries. The second rule is where that person has the main center of vital interests. This can be the family, the, the income. So if you are living in Portugal, but getting income from uh, companies in Ukraine and your family, part of your family is still in Ukraine, that can be considered your um, main country of residence. So it has to be seen on a case by case basis um, according to the double tax treaty. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So what we'll do now is we will send an email to everybody uh, and we will share Claudia's and Nunu's and Michaela's email addresses and Samantha's website. So if you have further questions, please feel free to contact them directly. We will also share the recording in, uh, next week on our YouTube uh, channel, which is BTCC um, Academy. So feel free to review um, all the information that was said today and shared with you. And thank you very much for attending and thank you to our great panel of speakers. Thank you so much.